A very good morning to all the respected dignitaries on the dais, faculty, staff and fellow students. I, Apurva Mahendru, President of the MSc Student Council. And I, Chirag Dosh, President of the BSc Student Council, are here to welcome you all to the 5th Professor Suresh Tendulkar Memorial Lecture. This lecture series commenced in 2014 and have been home to some of the most enlightening and enriching academic discourses at SSE. We are truly honoured to be at the receiving end of such illuminating lectures by pronounced economists and academicians. Also, throughout the lecture, you can tweet about it using the hashtag STML5. We now invite Dr. Jyoti Chandramani, Dean of Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences and Director of Simbas School of Economics to address the gathering. A very, very warm good morning to this August gathering. <laughs> Having gathered here today to hear the fifth Professor Suresh Tendulkar Memorial Lecture. On behalf of Symbiosis School of Economics and my fraternity, I take this pleasure to welcome our Dean Academic and Administration, Dr. Bhama Venkatramani. And on behalf of Symbiosis International University and all the top dignitaries, and all of you, sir, I welcome Dr. Maitresh Ghatak, Professor, London School of Economics, for having taken the effort to come and honor this particular day. Thank you so much. I also, on behalf of the Symbiosis Fraternity, thank Mrs. Tendulkar for her very presence out here. Ma'am, your presence here makes us feel indeed very blessed, and I feel we have Professor Suresh Tendulkar here amidst us. Uh, you know, what, what is one supposed to speak on this day in the morning, you know, when you have tall people sitting on the dais? But nevertheless, a little formality that I need to go through is I'll speak a bit about SC, not more than two lines about it, about STML, about Professor Tendulkar, and a bit on poverty. And coming from there, uh, SSE, it's a great year for all of us. We've completed a decade. We are going to deliver the fifth Tendulkar Memorial Lecture. So in 10 years, we are having five lectures. I think that's a good achievement. Uh, we've had eight BSc batches graduate, six MSc batches graduate, from 82 students to 550 plus students, plus 1,000 alumni that have been nurtured in this very place, offering two very evolved programs, the BSc Economics, which became honors from 2014, and MSc Economics with three specializations, International Trade, Development Studies, Urban Development, the only school of economics offering a specialization in urban development, and from next year, we would be offering Financial Economics. So I think that's the journey onward. I think we deserve an applause for that. In terms of research, we are on the verge of completing the project assigned to us by NABAD, National Bank for Agriculture and Rural Development, titled Rural Development Infrastructure Index for the 33 districts of Maharashtra. It has been accepted by NABAD. It's just in print stage. We are also working on the 10 smart cities of Maharashtra and the Goa Governance Index. Now I come to today's program that why is Symbiosis hosting the Tendulkar Memorial Lecture? And it takes me back to the year in which I took over as director and I realized that MSE has to come in. And along with a couple of my colleagues, I remember Ishita was there by my side. We had two other colleagues at that point of time. One is Anushri Paul and the other was Shantanu Re Chaudhary. And we stitched together the MSE program. I also remember standing in a board of studies meeting for four hours, fighting with Professor Pradeep Apte to get this program seen. It's not easy to get a program on its two feet in a, in a university. It has its own processes. And while this program was set up, I knew at the back of my mind that just a kilometer down the road, we had Professor Tendulkar, who had shifted in at that point of time to Pune. So I said the day our program gets live, and we have our students, I will reach out to him and ask him to be our mentor. Unfortunately, that day didn't come because before our program could take off, Professor Tendulkar was no more. 
And then in 2014, I had the courage to go to Bombay to meet Mrs. Tendulkar and family. And I thank Mrs. Tendulkar, Sai and Zoe for giving us this consent and for us institutionalizing this particular uh, memorial series that we have every year. Coming uh, from there, about Professor Suresh Tendulkar, I met him first. He was the first economist I heard speak on the reforms post-1991. And I remember him going down to BMCC and hearing him speak because he's an alma mater of BMCC. And when he spoke on that particular day, I remember his speech, his words, his wisdom, and how an economist at that point of time who always thought of the economy differently, and then you look at it getting liberalized, sharing his thoughts in a very humble but you know very clearly to us. Professor Tendulkar then completed his master's. His journey began with BMCC. I'm giving a little brief profile of Professor Tendulkar. Then he went on to doing his master's in economics and statistics from Delhi School of Economics and completed his PhD from Harvard. In fact, our guest of today, Professor Khattak, has gone the same way followed the footsteps of his guru, gone to DSC and then to Harvard. Uh, later, uh, Professor Tendulkar taught at Indian Statistical Institute at the Delhi Center and has been associated with Delhi School of Economics from 1978 to 2004. And it's during this period that Professor Maitresh was his student, you know, in the early 90s. Professor Tendulkar was director, Delhi School of Economics from 1995-98 member of the 1993 expert group on estimation of proportion and number of poor, member of the 5th Central Pay Commission, then again member of the Disinvestment Commission, National Statistics Commission, and the list goes on and comes down to, in 2004-2008, he was member of the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council and between 2008 and 9, chairman of the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council. Uh, his path-breaking work was on measurement and analysis of living standards in India with a focus on inequality and poverty. And this remains his lasting legacy to public policy. The Tendulkar Committee recommendations marked a clear break from the past in explicitly moving away from the caloric-based norms that anchored the original official poverty line at 1973-74 prices. It also recommended that the rural poverty line should be recomputed to reflect money value in rural areas of the same basket of consumption that is associated with existing urban poverty ratios. Today, in 2016, Niti Aayog has reverted back to the Tendulkar poverty line uh, for its analysis and further estimations to benchmark as to what should be the line and how you need to push people above. For today's topic on poverty, when I was, you know, we've been working on SDGs at, at School of Economics, and the 17 goals that are there of the SDGs, when you see them, they've all got colors in the latest report of 2017. And the colors are green, yellow, orange, and red. The only color which is yellow for India is on poverty. That means we are slowly moving towards the green. And on all other parameters, we are either in the red or in the orange. And yet today's question is so pertinent because why does poverty still persist? Okay, taking it forward from here, we'd be happy to hear Professor Maitrish give his words, share his views on this. From here, I now request all the dignitaries that we go and light the lamp. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Lighting up the lamp marks the triumph of light over darkness invoking Goddess Saraswati to instill knowledge, wisdom, and goodwill within us. We invite the MSc Music Club Raga to, in, to recite the Saraswati Vandana. We request Mrs. Tendulkar to join us for the lighting of the lamp.
Thank you everyone. It's now time to extend a warm welcome to the dignitaries for the day. <coughs> we have in our midst Dr. Bhama Venkata Ramani, <coughs> Dean of Academics and Administration at Symbiosis. As Dean Academics and Administration, she oversees the Academics Department, Symbiosis Training Learning Resource Center, the Library of Symbiosis International Deemed University, the schools and the service providing departments of Symbiasis and as such, she, she, she contributes to policy framing and monitoring outcomes desired and articulated by Symbiasis. She holds a PhD in Finance from University of Pune with about 30 years of experience in teaching and academic administration. Her research interests focus on financial inclusion and inclusive education and have led to papers published in index journals. She has to her credit a monograph and nine book chapters in books prescribed for graduate students of University of Pune. She has supervised three doctoral students to completion and award of PhD degree. She was the founder director of two institutes of Symbiosis International Deemed University, namely Symbiosis Center for Management Studies Pune in 2004 and Symbiosis School of Banking Finance 2010. Thank you so much for being here, ma'am. We would also like to acknowledge our Chancellor, Dr. S.B. Majumdar, our Pro-Chancellor, Dr. Vidya Rebarkar, and Vice-Chancellor, Dr. Rajni Gupte, who, due to some crucial and important commitments, could not attend today's lecture. However, they have all expressed their good wishes to Professor Maitrish Gatta, and our video recording of the talk will be shared with them. Our guest of honor for the day is Professor Maitrish Gatta. Maitrish Gatta is a Professor of Economics at the London School of Economics and Political Science. He's an applied microeconomic theorist with research interests in economic development, public economics, microfinance, property rights, occupational choice, collective action, and the economics of organizations. He did his schooling in Pat Bhavan, Kolkata, and went on to do his undergraduate studies at Presidency College, Kolkata. He has an MA in economics from the Delhi School of Economics and a PhD in economics from Harvard University under the supervision of Eric Maskin and Abhijit Banerjee. He taught at the Department of Economics of University of Chicago before moving to the London School of Economics and Political Science, where he has been teaching since 2002. He has held visiting positions at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, Yale University, Northwestern University, and the Indian Statistical Institute, Kolkata. He is currently a co-editor of Economica, a former managing editor of the Review of Economic Studies, a former editor-in-chief of the Journal of Development Economics, and a former co-editor of the Economics of Transition. He directs the research group Economic Organization and Public Policy at the LSE. He is the lead economist of the DFID-funded International Growth Center's India program in Bihar. He is a board member of the Bureau for Research in the Economic Analysis of Development, also known as the BRED. He writes occasional essays in various newspapers and magazines on economic and political issues in English as well as in Bengali. In July 2018, Professor Ghatak was elected Fellow of the British Academy. We are truly honored to have you amidst us, sir. We request Dr. Bhama Venkataramani to felicitate our guest of honor, Dr. Maitrish Kata. Thank you, ma'am. We request our director, Dr. Jyoti Chandramani, to felicitate our Dean of Academics and Administration, Dr. Bhama Venkataramani. Thank you, ma'am. We also have in our midst Mrs. Tendulkar, and we request our Deputy Director, Dr. Devdalal Thakur, to felicitate her. Ma'am, could you please come on stage? We 
now invite Dr. Bhama Venkatramani to give her opening remarks. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Professor Maitreej Gattak, uh, Dr. Chandi Ramani, family members of uh, Professor Tendulkar, Mrs. Tendulkar and his niece, uh, Dr. Debulal, members of the faculty and my dear friends. It gives me immense ple uh, pleasure to be here today. First of all, to welcome all of you on behalf of the Chancellor, the Pro-Chancellor and the Vice-Chancellor. And also to be here to listen to Professor Maitreej uh, Gatak on the fifth edition of the Suresh Tendulkar Memorial Lecture. Dr. Jyoti had explained in detail how this event was conceived as a fitting tribute to Dr. Suresh Tendulkar's contribution as an outstanding academician and an economist. At this juncture, I would like to thank Mrs. Tendulkar for according us the privilege of hosting this event. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. It means a lot to us. What has been even more gratifying is that for each of these five lectures that, have, that we've had, and we've had such towering personalities like Dr. Subir Gokarn, Dr. Ma uh, Mahindra Dev, uh, I, I, we had uh, Dr. Vivek Deboy uh, and uh, Mrs., uh, Mr. Narasimhan Srinivasan and now uh, Dr. Maitreesh Gatak. It, uh, it is the presence of these towering personalities that this event becomes so important and we all look forward to this event every year. Dr. Suresh Tendulkar's contribution, his work, his extensive work on poverty, the redef redefinition of the poverty line basket towards calculating the threshold of poverty have been his pioneering contributions. We will soon have the pleasure of listening to Dr. Gatak and learning more about why poverty is persistent. We look forward to that. But at this juncture, I would like to take a, a slight detour when I was listening to Dr. Jyoti, I was also looking up uh, Dr. Gatak's uh, profile. A couple of things stood out. In fact, four things stood out. The first one is the brilliant academic foundation that they've had. Good master's degree from DSC, then they went on to Harvard to get their PhD, and then they continue their work in research. A, a, a astounding educational foundation. The second thing I noticed was both of them had have focused career, uh, uh, what should I say, focused activities in their career. For example, both of them are into teaching and into research and uh, Dr. Jyoti was bringing to our notice that uh, Dr. Tendulkar was working had worked for about 36 years, I was just doing a mental math, about 36 years, over the period of which he's almost published uh, close to 100 papers, and all his research revolved around real problems that he saw around him. So a, a brilliant teaching and, and research career. The third thing I noticed is both of them have held leadership positions which were steering their institutes to greater heights. And of course, thought leadership, Dr. Jyoti could not list the number of commissions that he was on where he contributed significantly to policy making. I would like to take this opportunity to quote Professor T.A. Bhavani, a, a co-author of uh, Professor Tendulkar. And she said, I used to call him the frontier function a term in economic literature that often charts the maximum attainable value, since he was a role model in all aspects of life. She used the, the term frontier function. If we were all to draw inspiration from Professor Tendulkar and of course from Professor Gatak, I am sure in years to come, many of you will come back to SSC as distinguished, accomplished economists and 
in whatever chosen field. I wouldn't say that all of them will become academicians, but in whatever chosen field, you will definitely come back as di distinguished economists to probably speak in some of the future Tendulkar Memorial Lectures. At this junction, I, juncture, I also would like to take this opportunity to bring to your notice that SSC has done phenomenal work in the last 10 years and to bring such towering stalwarts to you, to interact with you, to talk to you, is, is such an enriching environment. And I'm sure, Professor Ghatak, in years to come, these students will probably cherish these sort of interactions and remember them far more than what they have learnt inside the classrooms. And, and they are going to cherish this long after the programs have been completed. Dr. Ghatak, we thank you for accepting our invitation, for being here with us today to speak to us on this topic that, that has been chosen. Your being here has definitely enhanced the stature of this event. We look forward to listening to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. We now have a short movie tracing the timeline of the Professor Suresh Tendulkar Memorial Lecture Series. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to deliver the fifth uh, Suresh Tendulkar Memorial Lecture. Um, um, assorted dignitaries and especially Dr. Jyoti Chaliramani who I have been in touch with um, uh, to, uh, that made this uh, visit possible and thanks uh, for the uh, hospitality as well as the uh, warm introduction and I'm especially honored that Mrs. Tendulkar happens to, uh, was, it was possible for her to attend this occasion. Um, so because it was uh, the Suresh Tendulkar Memorial Lecture, the choice of the topic was relatively straightforward for me because uh, poverty and in particular persistence of poverty has been a recurring theme of my own research and uh, for the, um, what um, some, the earlier speaker uh, spoke about uh, Tendulkar's work, his um, policy work on estimation of poverty in India is pioneering and I will mention a few words about it but it uh, really doesn't need too much introduction. So today what I'm going to talk about is uh, a brief introduction to a certain research agenda I have, and in particular when I say persistence of poverty, it means not just why there is poverty and what can be done about it, it's like is poverty a sticky state as opposed to a transient state, and to the extent it's a sticky state, what kind of special policies might be needed other than just a small nudge or a small push that could be um, uh, sufficient to deal with the problem of poverty. So I will touch upon some very recent work that I'm doing with my colleagues at LSC. Um, uh, they are mentioned here, Oriana Bandhira and Robin Burgess are colleagues of mine and the other two are PhD students. And I will mention a little bit of that very current work I'm doing. But because it's a public lecture, I will skip some of the technical details of, of this research and try to give you a kind of overview of the current thinking on this topic, my own work or my own perspective on it, and where I'm planning to go with that. So uh, Professor Tendulkar was my professor at the Delhi School of Economics, uh, uh, in, in where I studied from 1989 to 1991. Um, um, in fact, the course was called Economic Development and Planning in India, EDPI as it was called, and Professor Tendulkar as well as uh, Sundaram, uh, Professor Sundaram who was a frequent co-author of Professor Tendulkar were uh, those who taught this course. And indeed, uh, some of this uh, was already mentioned, but I think it is appropriate for me to say a few words about it, that Professor Tendulkar's uh, pioneering cont contribution, something that has made him a household name in the policy circles or the media discussions about uh, actual, whenever we say percentage of people below poverty line in India, uh, there is some methodology that Professor Tendulkar introduced in the report that has subsequently been called or referred to as the Tendulkar Committee Report. And this is an excellent example of somebody's academic career, started off in a very narrow academic world and then it has percolated down 
to a policy relevant uh, uh, issue uh, and nothing could be more relevant than measurement and, 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 and estimation of poverty. Again, I will, uh, a lot of this may be well known and if I had uh, more time, I would in fact, there could be a whole lecture devoted to how the methodology of estimating poverty has evolved in India from what was the calorie-based consumption uh, measure in the earlier era to what uh, Professor Tendulkar and his committee introduced by basically expanding uh, the dimension in which uh, poverty uh, factors that were included in poverty because the calorie consumption is a core survival measure. You could have a core caloric consumption measure, but you could otherwise still be very um, um, limited in terms of your state of capabilities, as Amatya Sen puts it. You could literally be surviving on a day-to-day -day basis, okay? But you could be of scarce functioning, scarce capability, and scarce ability to uh, earn a living or live a productive life. For that, you need a whole range of activities, goods, services, investments, public uh, uh, you know, education, transportation, everything you can think about. And in some ways, the thinking about poverty, I think one way, at least certainly in my own research, I think about poverty, is you could always think of poverty as poverty is something that happens to others. Because most of us who are in this room possibly didn't experience extreme poverty. I mean, I, there may be exceptions, occasional exceptions, but most of us did not experience the kind of abject poverty that, for example, a poverty line uh, in the Indian context would uh, tend to capture. And so therefore, it, one might think about this as, as happening to other, other folks, even though we might be very sympathetic about it, but it's something that happens to others. But another way to look at it, uh, the way I, in my own theoretical as well as academic, empirical academic work on poverty, think about it. Think about poverty as, say, a child is born. And that child can grow or develop in ways that, say, medicine and nutritionists would think about, right? Including psychological development. Or the child could get stunted in some ways because of lack of certain critical nutrition, other um, uh, sort of immunity development and so on, that child could essentially be stunted in terms of its physical or mental development, which would perpetually handicap person's overall productive ability to live a healthy, productive life, right? So going back to what we were, uh, a previous speaker was referring to about the frontier function, Think about human capabilities as the frontier. All of us are born with a certain set of genetic attributes. Then the environment, the society, all these things sort of, these are investments, these are things that nurture us, that enable us to grow. And then we contribute back to society, okay? And if you think about the full potential of a human being, the full potential, somebody in terms of the core, say physical, genetic, and other capabilities, Clearly the society you live in and the economic conditions you face shape that, right? So therefore, one way to think about poverty is not just it just happens to other people and the poverty trap model, okay? These two specific uh, mechanisms. And in the poverty trap model listed the various possible mechanisms that could lead to this. I, I'm prefacing or I'm basically focusing this discussion on production where the production technology could be non-convex and there could be markets that are imperfect but I could give you other examples. Think of nutrition. If your nutrition is at a certain below a certain level you do not have the body mass index to be able to generate the kind of energy that would need for manual work and that therefore would make you less productive in the workplace and therefore Interestingly, even though you're poor and willing to work for low wages, no one would hire you because you're simply not biologically or sort of physically able to do certain activities, right? Once again, of course, this person could get a loan and try to develop his, you know, uh, health better before you get to do that. But for a number of reasons, that market will not work well that we kind of know. So there could be other mechanisms too. Just the fact that you need certain increasing returns in the production process is not the only mechanism. Now what we do, I do in the next two diagrams, and then I go straight to the empirical context for the rest of, uh, rest of the time I have. 
So basically this diagram now takes a very textbook model of what uh, the sort of growth literature focuses on. So what we have on the horizontal axis is capital at time t. And what we have on the vertical axis is capital at time t plus 1. And for the convenience of our discussion, we can think of these as just money. Kt is really whatever you have in your bank, including the value of your assets at time t, and Kt plus 1 is what you have next year. Yeah? Those diagrams that are drawn there essentially capture alternative functions that take the current capital and generate the future capital. Without wanting to get into too much into the technical details, they have two terms. One is whatever is last period's capital, net of depreciation, that's 1 minus delta times kt. So whatever initial capital you had, some of it depreciated, some of it was used up as working capital, and so that you have a bit less left. And the rest is really the saving that you have out of the output you generate. So A times F of K is your production, as in the standard uh, case in which economists model uh, production from capital. And what these two blue curves show is p potential different effects of productivity. So if the A parameter, the productivity parameter differs, you would reach different steady states. So this is a formalization of the idea that with different economic fundamentals, you could reach at different steady states, and therefore poverty could be a convergent process, but still you could have to work on policies that improve overall productivity to lift everybody above a certain level. So that's one view of it. This is a more formal version of that sticky figures trying to run up the st uh, steep mountain face uh, story. And here what we have is KT on the, uh, again, on the horizontal axis, KT plus one on the vertical axis. And everything is, else is the same, except for this curve looks a bit wiggly, okay? And those of you uh, who are economists, and I'm not assuming all of you are, are uh, you will immediately recognize that this is a production function that does not satisfy the standard prop properties of diminishing returns because the first part of it actually shows increasing returns. But we can leave that technicality aside. What's interesting here is that this curve actually intersects that black line twice, yeah, actually thrice. If you see there's an intersection at zero, there's an intersection at, at kh, and there's a critical point k hat. You know what is the beauty of this intersection of this black line with this blue wiggly curve? Those have the feature because the black line is nothing but a line with slope 45 degree. So any point you take from KT will give you exactly the same value on the other axis. What does it mean? You have reached some stability. You start with a certain KT and you stay at that KT plus one is also equal to that KT so that you're kind of, you know, you have a center of uh, gravity there. Yeah? As you can see from the diagram, and here I will not um, get into the sort of more detailed economic logic behind it, but there are three potential stable st st steady states. One is actually at zero. If you're at zero, even if you're given a bit more, yeah, next period's capital stock is going to be actually less than how, you, how much you're given. So you can just see that if you're starting with zero, and suppose you're given delta, yeah, some small amount, the 45 degree line is what would give you next period capital stock to be that delta, but the blue line is lying below that. So your actual capital next period will be less than that. That means you're going to go back to zero. This doesn't happen to be true for the KH steady state, because you can again do mentally, if you're given a bit more, you'll come back to it, even give less, you'll grow up to it. So that's the state steady one. The intermediate one is the interesting one. So this is exactly the point of that mountain, the steep mountain face, where if you have just a little less than k hat, you'll actually go to the stable steady state of zero. And if you just have a bit more than k hat, you'll go up to the top of the hill. So this is the more uh, technical or textbookish version of that more entertaining kind of you know, uh, uh, little movie we had. Okay, so this is exactly the case that captures the um, unequal opportunities view from the equal opportunities and economic differences being driven by fundamentals view. Okay, now I want to basically go to the empirical context that um, I, I, I want to uh, sort of uh, the subject of my empirical research on, on this topic. 
So my co-authors, Oriana Bandier and Robin Burgess, with some of their other co-authors, they published this paper in the Quarterly Journal of Economics in 2017, which is a very interesting survey they did. So now I'm switching from the big picture discussion about you know, why we should care about poverty, okay? What has happened to global poverty over the years? Theoretical notions of poverty, theoretical or conceptual ways in which we can think about poverty, okay, and it's persistent, and to a very specific empirical context, okay, where we're trying to test which notion of this poverty, is it sticky, which needs a big push, or is it a more convergent process where even changes in the fundamentals are what are needed. So in this study, which is very large scale by modern standards, especially for a non-government survey, they surveyed over 21,000 households in more than 1,300 villages in rural Bangladesh. And essentially this is, was done in collaboration with one of their major NGOs in Bangladesh called BRAC, uh, Bangladesh Rural Action Committee, which other than Grameen, uh, they are the kind of the two big giant uh, sort of uh, poverty focused NGOs in Bangladesh and there are many others. Now what is unique about this study, which is compared to many some of the old style surveys that were done, this was actually what in the modern language are called a randomized control trial. What is a randomized control trial? Well, in the last two decades, this is a method that has become increasingly being used in empirical development work. And economists such as my uh, former uh, co-supervisor at Harvard, Abhijit Banerjee, and uh, his frequent co-author, Esther Duflo, have written a book, Poor Economics, which discusses some of this. And of course, there's a lot of research goes on. The beauty of randomized control trials is whatever policy that you want to study, Suppose you want to see that whether giving people training is what helps. Okay, you need to give, say you want uh, rural unemployed, you want to see whether giving them training to do certain little business is what is going to make a difference. What you do is, unlike earlier studies, where you do it in a number of areas and then say, look, in these areas we see a return or a benefit that is this percentage in terms of the actual investment, whereas in other areas it's less. These were subject to the standard critique that these were areas were not chosen randomly. So if I do a study in a given area, there are, could be several problems that that choice of that area is not random. It's like if I want to test a drug, I need to randomly choose the patients for which I'm applying it to because I'm choosing relatively healthy patients. Then uh, that drug may be more effective than very, very uh, sort of ill patients and so on. So RCTs, which is the abbreviation of randomized control trials, immediately take this problem away because like in medical trials, you give this policy in some areas and do not do it in other areas in ways that were at an earlier stage randomly chosen. So this basically has first the fact that the programs are not selectively placed. Okay, they are genuinely randomly placed, so therefore whatever is the outcome of it, you can say is what that program caused. Okay? The second, there are many other features of this, but let me not uh, digress too much into it, but I'm happy to come back that into the Q&A. So what this study did was all the ultra poor, and they were defined in terms of not having assets above a certain level, they were basically either assigned to what in technical term of these randomized control trials are called treatment groups, which is exactly borrowed from the practice of medicine, that suppose I in this room, I have all of you, okay, and then maybe I assign you alphabetically, or maybe in some ways, okay, and then every other person, one, three, five, gets a certain treatment and the others are just not given anything. If I then compare it, I could say that's a reasonably random comparison of the control and uh, the two groups in this, uh, in this room. So basically, all the ultra poor in these villages were assigned to these either treatment or control. And what happened was, essentially they were given a lump sum asset transfer of roughly speaking $560 in 2007 purchasing power terms. These are all ways in which you make money comparable to some international currency with fixed prices and so on. 
Now, what was interesting is, and this is where it's connected to the theoretical diagrams I showed you, as well as those little amateurist movie clips I showed you. Essentially, in terms of those diagrams, this is equivalent of giving one of the sticky figures a big push. Because 560, indeed, in terms of the baseline, before this study was carried out, it's nearly double the average wealth of, you know, it's nearly double of the average wealth of the recipient of these uh, ultra poor groups. Okay, the question is, and this is where a theory can be combined with empirics with hopefully interesting insights, because theory tells us in these two worlds we actually know what this will happen, what this will cause. If I go to this world, okay, suppose anybody you have all these people randomly distributed on the horizontal axis. That's their initial capital. Yeah. And now, roughly speaking, I've given them all the same amount, that $560, yeah? What this diagram tells you is not much will happen. Those who already had a lot, this extra amount would then lead to decumulation and they will be back at their old steady state. Whereas those who didn't have much, that will speed up their movement to the steady state and then they will converge. So therefore, it is going to display the following property which economists call mean reversion that if you looked at their initial capital on one axis and what happens to their accumulation of capital, those with more capital will decumulate and those with less capital will accumulate and eventually they reach the steady state. But think about this diagram. Here, if the underlying economic mechanism is described like this diagram, okay, then depending on where you were initially, so think of K0 as your initial capital, the question is, is K0 plus this $560 worth of capital get you above K hat or not? If it gave, gets you above K hat, then you're going to have a virtuous cycle and it will take you all the way up to the good steady state. But if your initial capital was too low that even with $560, you're falling short of the K-hat, it will not be much use to you. You will decumulate and fall below. Yeah? So if I have to, as best as I could uh, this uh, today uh, uh, here, describe the core idea of our current research, which of course has lots of technical aspects which would not be suitable <laughs> for a more uh, sort of public lecture like this one, this is the core idea behind the current work we did, namely um, uh, going back to the original survey that they did and the uh, basic results they've already published. In the current pa paper that we are writing, okay, we basically test that if you look at the incremental saving behavior and correlate that with their initial capital stock, do we see a behavior pattern that is, would be more consistent with a worldview where people are essentially converging up to a unique steady state versus a world where there could be a vicious cycle of poverty. So unless a specific threshold is hit, some people will fall below and others above that will go up. What is kind of mathematically or statistically nice about it is because these functions are different, it gives a very concrete structure as to what you should be looking in the data. Okay, so that's exactly what we do in the exercise. Okay, so what I want to now tell you is a bit about what this original study found and what is our core finding in the current project and I'll stop there and I'll be happy to take questions and answers because I have enough material to keep you um, regaled or not so regaled for uh, much longer but I would much rather have a chance to have a conversation and take questions than uh, go through all the details of this. Okay, so what they did in this particular setting and let me skip some of the details uh, essentially, this is Bangladesh, and it's those yellowish parts of Bangladesh where the study area was done. And essentially, the green spots are the black bunches where the uh, transfer was carried out, and the red spots are the ones that were the control areas which were surveyed all through. 
Okay? And eventually, though, some of the control areas, those people eventually got it too, because you could not keep them deprived for very long, which is often a problem with randomized trials. If you give some poor people some asset or some facility, and there are other villages we are not doing it, it is very good for the science, but there is an ethical challenge here, because you are you know, using those in the control villages as some kind of experimental subject to get your answer here. Anyway. So what they found is the following. If I really summarize what they're doing and really not get into the technical details, these were all targeted to women. By design, BRAC and Grameen work basically 99% with women, okay? And that's part of their social mission um, and so on. So we are really talking about rural women. What the study found was that basically they divided the poor in four classes, ultra poor, which are kind of people who really don't have much other than a homestead, which is a shanty-like thing in a village, and that's where they live, to those who are called upper class, but that upper class is still there, really rural poor women there, but they may have a more concrete structure of a house, a little maybe cow shed where they keep have a cow or something, so that kind of thing, they're not really very rich. So what they found was the core occupations were casual labor, okay, which is some of them were maids in other houses or agricultural labor, and the others were basically livestock business, which is selling milk really, it's as simple as that, goat and cows, okay, and some poultry, poultry too, chicken was, uh, chicken and eggs were part of the story too. Now what is nice about this application is starting from a very big picture, now we are in a very concrete setting. This is a rural area of Bangladesh, okay, where we are looking at women with concrete occupational uh, options, which is to be a worker, a casual worker, or have a self-employment. And one of the striking things is that they found is, let me skip the thing, that basically if you put their baseline productive assets, whatever assets they had, if you put, that, put, put their monetary value on them, it is much better to be a livestock business person, but for that you need baseline productive assets above a certain level. That is what this graph is capturing. Whereas if you do casual labor, you have a flat earning, and that is actually better than doing livestock if you have very little, because then for the rest of your time, you're not doing much, and you might as well use your time uh, to do the labor. So basically what they found was, the relatively richer women, and rich I use within quotes here, because none of them is rich by even uh, sub, uh, sub, uh, South, South Asian standards. The livestock earning women were earning a lot more, and yet the poorer women could not get into that, because they did not have initial baseline assets, which indeed include cows and goats and chicken, as well as other assets like a cycle rickshaw or a rickshaw van or a boat. This is a river-intensive part of Bangladesh, which allows you to sell your products to neighboring villages and so on. So what we saw is that the poorer women mostly do laborer work, the richer women do livestock work, and the livestock earnings are much higher than the poorer women you know, what the laborers get. This, you may say that, look, why did I need to do a study here? This is what our casual empiricism would, empiricism would tell you anyway. Well, first of all, this is a rigorous statistical survey because, you know, casual empiricism can always, you know, mislead you. You need to do a systematic survey. But deeper though, it raises an economic question. Why aren't those poor women saving and accumulating assets and getting into livestock? So that's the basic thing, because it's really as simple. If in a certain area you have two occupations, one occupation has higher return than the other, and it requires some assets, why aren't you saving up and getting there? Or why aren't you borrowing and getting there? And this is nice because it exactly connects with the theoretical framework that I set up, because if you just saved KT plus one, KT plus two, are you reaching a steady state or not? What they found was, uh, let me just summarize what these guys found and what we do, and that's where I'll stop. So basically, after they transferred this money, most of the women opted to take this money in the form of a cow. 
Some took them in the form of other assets like a sewing machine and so on, but it's a large statistical survey and that's why we have only reported the core occupations. And what was the other great thing about this survey, other being a, it's a randomized study, is they actually tracked these women two years, four years, and seven years after the program. This is really big, and it was only possible because BRAC is a big institution that worked with it, because think about it, one of the things any economist or policymaker would love to get about India is tracking the same household over time and tracking what is happening to their income, because that gets away from the cross-section poverty to a long-term mobility issue. Because if I really track the same person over time, then we could say, look, in a snapshot, they may be a lot poor, but a lot of this poor in the future periods are not staying poor. That's a very different view from if you just had a largely cross-sectional view of the world. So after four years, what they found is ultra-poor women change jobs and work more hours. So one of the main things this randomized trial that gave this ultra poor woman, those who were in the treatment group, this transfer, they were basically working overall more hours. How did that happen? Because with agriculture work, um, most of the work in the lean season is zero. You have the peak season and the lean season, so they actually had underutilized labor resources. And once you have the livestock, you could smooth out your labor over all through the year. And basically that's what they're happening. They're spending more hours. They earn and consume more. Their earnings went up by 21%. Uh, and these are the other, other per PC, stands for per capita expenditure, expenditure on durables. Now, this is the stunning number, the savings that I still remember the evening. We were both at a World Bank conference, and Oriana and I started chatting, even though we are in the same corridor at LSC. In a given day, we don't get to talk to each other that much other than day-to-day -day university things. So we got started talking about their study and my own theoretical work. Savings had gone up four times of the ultra poor. And that really got me thinking that that's a big push that then led to some kind of a virtuous cycle where eventually some of those recipients are, you know, their saving went up four times. So therefore, there might be evidence for one of those poverty tri trap type mechanisms as opposed to a convergence mechanisms where saving really should not have gone up that much if the world was as described by the original figure that I did. Okay. Keeping in uh, mind the time constraint and, and so on, let me just summarize the core average findings of that study, which is the, if you did the cost of this program, the estimated increase in uh, the earnings showed a 22% return, which showed that if in a way markets worked well and capital markets were well functioning, Citibank or for that matter any other bank should be opening branches in these villages and investing the savings into these activities because overall the rate of return is 22% compared to other activities. Of course there's a whole set of reasons why, we, why they don't do it from economies of scale to transactions cost to cost of enforcing contracts which we will get into the whole reason why capital markets don't work like in the textbook. But basically what this uh, large transfer did was essentially allow the poor to escape this uh, initial situation where they had very low income and savings and capital stock to this high level. So in the current project what we did, so this is basically, uh, I will just show you two, three more slides and I'll stop. So this was what in the current research that we are looking at. So basically what we have on the horizontal axis is just productive assets in a log scale, okay? And what we have is that the yellow uh, or orangish yellow line is the baseline. This is before the intervention. And these curves are all probability density. So they have the standard properties that if you integrate, uh, if you take the whole area, they should have a density of one. So initially we can see that the orange yellow thing is largely concentrated around zero. But there's a spread. Some people have some initial level of capital. Okay? Then we have the green one, which is year two. Right after the transfer, a lot of them have crossed a certain threshold. Okay? And that's where they are. And then, of course, after year four, you see a further shift of this density. And then after year seven, you have this blue line that is flattened out. What do I want you to learn from this? First is, as we know in any probability density, 
anything that kind of, you think about a rubber band, think of these curves as rubber bands and you put them on two ends. Anything that kind of pushes the rubber band to the right and the right is a good thing because it means more and more people are getting with the higher values of the whatever variable you're capturing, right? So that's progress because more people have more stuff. That's why the curve is shifting, right? The second thing I want to take out, uh, you, uh, I want you to take out from this, is the fact that there's heterogeneity. Not everybody went up, even though all the uh, treatment people received this asset, some of them eventually fell back and the others kind of went up. And in a way, our current study, exactly this is the point of departure. Okay, that in the earlier study, it showed that on average, this program had a big impact on raising income levels and saving levels, but there was heterogeneity. Some people did well, some people did not so well, even though on average, things went fine. What explains this? Okay, so without really getting into the technicalities, which I'm happy to come back to uh, in, 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 our, uh, in, in our question and answer session, basically what we did was in a series of regression and other kind of analysis, what we did was we plotted or we essentially ran the change in assets, overall assets, as a function of initial assets and tried to test between those two curves. One, if you have those convergent kind of view, the more assets initially you have, the less will be the increment. And that's roughly speaking, subject to some technical functional form things you have to keep in mind. That's roughly the test. The other one says, yes, this is true only if there's a threshold, which you can fit polynomials and other standard techniques to find if there's a threshold, that above that, you see that kind of behavior. The more you have, you'll kind of have mean reversion, but below that, you will actually fall down. And we have some very convincing evidence that the second happens to be the case. And that's what we are very, in a way, uh, very, very excited about it. But let me take the big picture conclusion out of it. So uh, could I go absolutely towards the end? Uh, is there a way you can press control end? I don't have the keyboard. Just press control end. Escape. Fantastic. Uh, I will then, if you could just put it in the slideshow format, if you just go, I will then. Yeah, thank you. But no, this went to the first slide again. Okay, that's the long-handed way, but we'll get there. <laughs> we'll converge. Okay, just leave it there and I'll, I'll just use the clicker, thank you. Okay, so what I want to do is just show you two more things, just really one, but two double. So what's the big picture out of it? I started with why should we care about poverty? What's happening to global poverty, okay? Theoretical perspectives on how do we think about persistence of poverty. Then you could say a very specific Bangladesh rural women context where a specific policy was carried out. And from that, I said that we have reasonably rigorous evidence that there seems to be some threshold effect that if with a big push of assets, if you go above a certain threshold, then you seem to be able to climb out of poverty, but otherwise you fall back. That's the kind of summary of the broad things I've said so far. But now I want to just, in my conclusion, just really show you two diagrams in the following way. Suppose we compare other anti-poverty programs. What's the biggest anti-poverty program in India? Well, there are several. There's the food distribution system, the PDS1, there's the Narega, MG Narega, and etc., etc. And there have been other various other types of things that are going on. So in some ways, we can ask that what can we learn from this BRAC study, which we can then maybe import into the discussion in India and other places. So for that, we do the following hypothetical exercise. And I underline the word hypothetical because it says the following, it does the following thought experiment. That suppose everywhere 
the core economy is as described by this northern Bangladeshi villages. You know, it's like any thought experiment. Of course, it's absurd because there are different parts of India, etc. But what else do you do? You have one area from which you have concrete evidence and you're just saying, what do we do? So what we do is, if you look at different transfer programs that there could be and express them as fraction of per capita expenditure of a household. So if you look at the horizontal axis, one means you're giving them a transfer that is equal to their annual expenditure, per capita expenditure on consumption. So this is a way of making units comparable. So one means you've given them a big enough transfer which is exactly equal to their per capita annual household expenditure. Yeah. And of course, 0.2 means 20% of it and so on. In the vertical axis, what we are measuring based on this Bangladeshi sample are percentages of people who are falling short of our estimated K hat, which is the critical threshold above which you go on to virtuous cycle. What this cycle is basically saying, that the BRAC thing kind of was good enough that it gave the value of roughly 80%, 0.8 is where it's hitting one. So then you get to effectively fully eliminate the gap between what this person initially had and what now uh, would be needed to get out of poverty. Now this diagram is done with loving care, but unfortunately the fonts are too small for you to fully appreciate all that is in there, but it's displayed in the website link that I've shared with you and you can later take a look at it because I think it's quite informative. All these red lines are essentially different anti-poverty programs where suppose they were to be done in this rural context. So now we take whatever is the Narega money value, whatever is all these different programs, microfinance where you're basically giving $100 in PPP terms, microfinance, the third red line from the left is microfinance where you're giving $200, etc. And suppose instead of this BRAC program, you did this alternative programs. What this is telling us, those things, are what percentage of the people will then cross the threshold, okay? And what this diagram really shows you, that most of the comparable programs, they fall well short of bringing most people above the K-hat threshold, okay? And therefore, I think what the biggest policy conclusion I want to take from this you know, discussion, and that does have uh, validity outside of this context, poverty is a big problem that cannot be solved in a small way. Big problems need big solutions, and therefore, you can either say, look, I have so many other competing needs, I cannot take on the problem of poverty elevation full on, but what this study suggests, solution is possible, but it's gonna cost you. And why? Because incremental things are not gonna do the sufficient push to get those people out of that steep mountain face and take them on the top of the, um, their potential. I will stop here and then I am happy to uh, let um, uh, my host uh, uh, organize a question and answer and whatever would be the appropriate discussion. Thank you. Poverty as an economic problem has been at the core of development process of any country. We thank you sir for illustrating the issue and bringing out the significance of various drivers which could help driving people out of poverty. We also feel indebted to you for sharing with us your research work and enlightening us on the same. I'm sure everyone will be leaving the auditorium with some food for thought. Before that, we now open the floor for question and answer session. Sir, I have two questions. One is regarding uh, this kind of discussion which is, I believe it is under perfect information framework. Yeah, the, uh, if you relax with the perfect information, then this discussion, what you want to think about the impact of, um, about the impact of oil fuel, programs governed by all these uh, you know, state government or central government will not work because the main problem is information asymmetry. All the information about the subsidized credit, information about all these welfare generating uh, you know, programs that goes to only the upper section of the uh, poor people. And um, uh, so what is the 
point of doing even this kind of work if it doesn't work really under imperfect information. And another question is, because we need to do policy framework given the uh, no real scenario. So, and another question that it is uh, theoretical, so in uh, regarding that diagram where you showed the increasing returns to scale in production function, that phase, and then if I, I believe it is short-run framework, if I make uh, you know, more capacity, and may, uh, the frontier will even change more. And then the curve, uh, increasing returns to scale curve will also you know, make change and get wider frame. So again, that problem of um, getting down to the previous level will come emerge. This, what is your suggestion on that? Sure. No, I think that I actually disagree with the premise of your first question, because what you're saying is we have a given setting, which is comparable to India, which is Bangladesh, where a very real-world institution carried out a survey where 4,000 women were actually given out a policy, and from that we actually studied their behavior over time. Now you are saying that, look, sir, if I do a, find a medicine which happens to cure tuberculosis under these circumstances, what is the meaning to do it in India because medi medical practitioners are quacks here? I'm not saying lack, any any <laughs> any policy. I I am with your premise that in the Indian context, a lot of these policies are subject. I would not use the word asymmetric information per se because look, capital markets imperfections embodies asymmetric information. Otherwise, capital would just flow there. So therefore, even in this framework, there's cap, you know asymmetric information in the backdrop. I think what you mean is badly executed, badly implemented policies that are subject to capture among the creamy layer, that's a very real problem. But look, as I told you, that should we stop research on what uh, reduces malaria because there are quacks out there in Rajasthan who will be selling you know, little chalk tablets and pretend to be that. So my point is, this is where I genuinely think in a lot of our policy discussion, we need to come out of a bit of an all or nothing kind of policy view that I often associate with a certain form of hard left thinking that either you get an ideal society where everything is working perfectly or let's not even bother doing anything because little changes will not do it. This is not exactly what you said and I think it's absolutely relevant to see what is the framework that will implement a policy but I still don't think that whether it's you will really break Jean Dres's heart which Jean Dres um, uh, and, and many others who have been working on this. There are many policies with good targeting even in India. He keeps on mentioning all these areas with the Jharkhand and so on where certain policies are well targeted. So I would not take such a sort of more, what can I say, uh, sort of more negative perspective that nothing is working and so on. Of course there's a big problem of capture. So that's my answer to your first question, okay? The second one, I think, is indeed uh, the, the, you know, with, as with any presentation, you only present a sketch of what we have done. But absolutely speaking, uh, you're absolutely right that we could incorporate uh, changes in productivity even in the uh, S-shape type thing. And what that would do is it will change the threshold around. In fact, the bulk of our ongoing paper and work is to really get a grip on the problem of unobserved productivity differences among these people because in the theoretical discussion I'm assuming they're all to be the same. Of course in the real world they're not to be the same and therefore in the econometric analysis we have to deal with the unobserved heterogeneity and therefore that is that point is well taken. Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. I'm a yeah. student of uh, DY BSC. Uh, oh. Right here. <laughs> so my question would be that as you showed the graph of two people walking up and uh, basic thing would be their initial wealth that accounted for them to rise up that slope. So I wanted to ask, is there is any other thing or what were those economic foreseen and unforeseen circumstances that led one to reach to the top and the one who kept tumbling apart over and over again if trying? destination? Fair enough. No, that's a very good question. So what I would, um, I would really, um, 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 you know, uh, to give a 
it's impossible to give you a kind of satisfactory answer to your question in the short time frame we have, but my World Bank Economic Review 2015 paper, if you just Google, uh, go to my website, it actually describes other mechanisms through which that can happen. But uh, since you asked the question, let me give you one example at least of the flavor of the kind of things you do. So you're absolutely right that here, it's a very simplistic framework, and again, Simplicity is good because everybody knows the world is complex, but as uh, one of my favorite examples which are widely used, imagine having a city map or a tube map that is fully descriptive. That would be unreadable, that will be unusable. We take a very stylized view of a city map or a tube map because it gives us roughly how to get from one point to the other without necessarily all the nuances uh, that would really be out there in the real world. So, in this setup, we have just taken a production indivisibility or non-convexity to use a bit of economic jargon and the particular form of non-convexity is the presence of fixed costs that you need a lumpy investment otherwise you don't get going, okay? You need a cow, you cannot buy a leg of a cow or a half a cow or a quarter cow, right? So you need a cow to get there and of course a credit market would have partly solved you because you've got to bought a cow and then paid it off but that's clearly not working. But other examples of why people could fall below that slope could be uh, absence of complementary inputs that you essentially, uh, to have a cow, you also need a bit of training. I mean, if I'm given a cow, I'll be a disaster. The cow will be suffering, I will be suffering because I would not know, have the knowledge as to how to deal with it. As much as if some of these women were given a laptop, the laptop will be damaged and they will also not benefit because clearly critical training is part of that. So you, of course, in a given context, you can make, uh, find out through the baseline survey what seems to be the binding constraint and then you target the intervention. That would be the spirit of an answer. Uh, so, so regarding that, so except the macroeconomic concepts that you have used in that example and that theory of yours, what would be the microeconomic ones that are sometimes overlooked? Because when you are doing a research on that large scale, you tend to overlook microeconomic factors, right? Sorry, I don't know how to answer that question except for this survey is entirely microeconomic in spirit. I mean, what would be macroeconomic to me? would be looking at economy-wide implications, say through general equilibrium, interaction with other markets and so on. And, you know, this study was microeconomic in nature. Yeah. But, yeah, I, I would say that it would very much, for macroeconomic analysis, you'd need more national income, uh, national employment type of data, and I view them as complements, not as substitutes. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So, quickly moving on to the next question uh, from our, our very own faculty, Deepika Ma. Good morning, sir. Sir, uh, I could see that uh, in the last slide that you had put up, so there were a number of programs which had been compared and you had put up an impulse function graph. Right? So uh, if I may uh, elaborate or try to get more clarity on that, you said installment payments do not get to that big push that is needed to cross that threshold. So. You mean to say somewhat that employment programs that are assigned for the reduction turn out to be less significant than transfer of assets directly? Yeah, I, I, that's, a very, that's a very good question and indeed I went through that slide very quickly. So I think that that did need clarification. I'm saying two things. So essentially, um, and they got mixed up. So if I separate out the two, of course, a lending program and a transfer program are different. Whether I give you 100 rupees and just say take it, or I give you 100 rupees and say next month give me back 120 rupees. So that's one dimension of difference. So on that, I lump the two together. And the other is big versus small, okay? So here, our focus is the big versus small. So our point is, a 200 microfinance loan, $200 loan, right? Even under reasonable lending terms is not big enough. If you gave them, equivalent of what would get them up to that, uh, you know, uh, cross the one level, the K hat amount, then you could potentially be thinking. But of course you're right that that one is a lending program and the other is a transfer program. Then you would need to look at the granularity of what lending does, what a pure transfer does. So here the simple point is small is not good enough. Small may be beautiful in some contexts, but in these sort of big push type of situations, small will only be a band-aid kind of thing that has its uses, but it's not going to get them people above a certain level. 
So may I ask you, uh, like you said, point eight was when the conversion started to happen. So uh, in terms of asset, you said that, okay, they demanded one cow or whatever. But uh, can you give me a value, if, if at all it has been found? So point eight refers to what kind of money value of that one or two cows or whatever. Look, these are the ultra poor in Bangladesh and the scale that you have on the horizontal axis is normalized. So it's 80% of their average um, uh, monthly uh, yearly expenditure. If I have to, and uh, I, I really would be surprised at myself if I had uh, in memory what was the average uh, consumption level of this particular sample. But if I do a roughly Indian counterpart example, these are analogous to the, you know, um, poverty line estimate or actually less. So then you can do the math. If you really think of 50 to be the average, then you can multiply 50 rupees per person per day times 365 days to get to the you know, yearly level. Then you can do a survey of what the average consumption percentage is. And then we are talking about various percentages of that. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh, Good afternoon, sir. I'm Urvashi. I'm a faculty uh, teaching public finance. So often in my class, we have a discussion on universal basic income and uh, as one of the measures which uh, can be adopted for removal of poverty. So I just want to know that uh, should targeted programs uh, be adopted for increasing the productivity or generic programs like this can also increase productivity and take people above the poverty line? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I, I happen to have written a fair bit on universal basic income and in fact right now I'm in the process of writing a long article. Um, so, um, so we are grappling with some of these issues. So I would say what is common between the idea of a universal uh, basic income kind of thing and this is it's a lump sum transfer. Okay, so that's the bit that is common. One morning you have a cow in front of your house, you know, that could be in kind, it could be in cash or a sewing machine, whatever. It was discussed in the, you know, discussed with the potential beneficiaries and of course it reflects the rural northern Bangladesh landscape. If it was a more peri-urban area, many, I'm sure some of these women would have wanted a sewing machine or a cooking gas type thing where they can, you know, sell some roadside food, etc. Yeah. But where I think what you are highlighted, rightly so, the main difference between universal basic income and any of these programs that were listed on that um, sort of compressed diagram, somewhat hard to read compressed diagram, is these are targeted, whereas universal basic income, the charm as well as the curse of a universal basic income is that it's not targeted. So what does that mean? If we start it, you get it, I get it, Mr. Ratan Tata gets it, and the very poorest of person gets it. And that's in a way problematic in two ways because it, think of the bill, even if you want to give every Indian one rupee, that's already we are talking about 1.3 billion rupees, right? So therefore that's the problem number one. Problem number two is our income tax base is very limited as everybody knows. And as a result, of course, essentially we don't want the rich to actually get it in net terms. All this means is like the rich can use the road too, the poor can use the road too, but then rich pay more taxes, so effectively they are paying for that, whereas maybe the poor are receiving. So with UBI too, that should be the underlying idea, because otherwise, why give the very rich, or even people like us, extra money when we, are, we don't need it? So I agree that in the unconditional transfer aspect of it, there is some commonality with an asset transfer program, but the targeting versus non-targeting, we are also getting into some of the question that uh, Shravani asked earlier, and that's a different program altogether, and indeed one of the reasons I have been an initially skeptic of UBI, and then several people, including Pranav Bhattun, my senior colleagues Pranav Bhattun, and Vijay Joshi and others who actually persuaded me, we had long debates, you know, face to face, and then uh, they persuaded me, that the deadweight loss of some of the programs are so big that some amount of unconditional income transfer does make sense. So in an ideal world, you don't want to do that because it's too wasteful to give it out and then try to claw it back. But in an imperfect world where a lot of these services are captured and so on, to the extent you can make a direct transfer to the bank, that might be a good idea. I think there was somebody in the same straight line in the back.
Good afternoon, sir. So this is Avijit from first year MSc. So I basically have two questions. Uh, one is, like you said, converging. If I take converging to be the catch-up effect, is it, is it the virtuous circle or the world, uh, vicious circle of poverty that affects the functioning of the catch-up effect? And the second question is, like you said, the market is convex. One reason for the con uh, is non-convex. Sorry, one reason for the non-convexity of the market is non-linear pricing. So, how is non-linear pricing affecting the persistence of poverty in India? Um, I, I think that there is some confusion of a terminology here. I think the catch-up has to do with the convergence world where you are just catching up to your capacity and you're starting less. So think of a child who's growing, who's going to grow up to say, I don't know, five foot five inches, whatever is the average height, and is growing and that child is going to catch up. And the um, poverty trap view is saying that unless you have an initial early childhood intervention, the child could get stunted and not grow, say, beyond four feet eight inches versus 5.5, right? And the term is not that markets are non-convex. That, that term really is not um, uh, what was used. It means that the production technology is non-convex. Of course, non-convex is a mathematical property that can apply to anything, from prices to quantities to output and so on. And to the extent non-linear pricing is used, that could indeed contribute to a similar mechanism. So that part of your question is, is correct. But it's too nebulous a thing to speculate, uh, right? I mean, if you think about it as to how, say, money lenders charge interest rates or how, say, uh, pharmaceuticals uh, price medicine and so on. But yes, there are theoretical analysis that shows that nonlinear pricing, when you have that kind of market imperfection, could also cause uh, some of these non-convexities. Um, good afternoon, sir. So my question is, so I understand that there are various reasons that... If you could stand up, I... Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> so I understand that there are various reasons that lead to or that can cause poverty. But in context of India, where a large number of population is involved into agriculture, and many people, they migrate to urban areas. So if we address the agricultural issues in our country or try to include technology, will that bring down poverty in our country by a large extent? Or it will not? Or we have to look for other solutions. Yeah, this is, no, this is a very relevant, uh, <laughs> perhaps one of the most relevant questions facing us. I would only take a little um, uh, sort of uh, nuance to your fact. If you actually look at the distribution of employment across sectors, it is still true that agriculture employs the most, but the informal urban or peri-urban sector is already quite large, which is implicit in your point that there's a lot of migration going on. So I no longer think that earlier, I would say 20 years earlier, I think I would say agriculture, agriculture and agriculture should be the focus of all policies because that is where either you want to ease a transition, structural transformation of the kind that Kuznets and others talked about. So I think coming back to your question, I think that look, um, clearly I think that in any developed country, the agricultural sector eventually shrinks to something like 3-4% of the population. Why? Because of course the other sectors are more value added. Like, why aren't any of us in agriculture? You know, especially, especially exactly applying the framework of this model to the extent, suppose, we do have a chance to go back to our ancestral villages and start agriculture. The reason we are not doing it is because, of course, it's not lucrative. Unless you want to set up a farmhouse and for lifestyle reasons, for, a, for an occupation reason, you would not do it. So you're exactly right that there are two ways to think about the agriculture. We don't want to make it lucrative enough for certain groups so that agriculture remains big because we all know that from the lessons of other developed countries that eventually you need, agriculture needs to release resources, land, labor, capital that goes into the industrial services, other sectors. That is the story of development from Britain's, you know, agriculture revolution preceding industrial revolution, etc., to other, other parts of the world. But on the other hand, we also need a highly productive agriculture to be there. So it's just the, you know, it's, it's, I think what we ha now have is a bad equilibrium, but it's a low productive sector which is absorbing a lot of people who are staying poor, where you want a lot of those people to be out of agriculture, to go into the industrial service and other sectors, right? And while those who stay in agriculture have good infrastructure, good price policies, so that they can make uh, uh, sort of, um, um, 
you know, benefit from it. Now, I again, it's just such a big question, especially in Maharashtra, where you had that farmers' march, right? That you know, maybe it was a year, year and a half ago, that, and so on, and the all the farmers' suicide stories and so on. So I could go into, we could have a longish discussion here just on that topic. So let me not venture out of what was the core issue of my presentation, but still, uh, this is a highly relevant issue. If you, if I give you one of the in a one-line answer to your broad perspective. I have been influenced uh, growing up in West Bengal in a kind of very charged left-wing discourse where land reform, tenancy reform kind of was seen as the only path. And I still believe they were a very good thing to do at the stage they were done. I have now come to take a more of a Maharashtrian, that, you know, starting from a whole distinguished uh, sort of a group of Marathi economists, uh, uh, and including, you know, my uh, good friend and co-author uh, Ashok Kotwal, who happens to, of course, he's, uh, he's an NRI. But anyway, so there's a whole group of Ashok and his friends, and of course, earlier Shara Joshi, and etc. So I think a lot of pricing policies are highly distorted in the Indian context, and that is where I think the left is very misguided in harping only on redistribution, whether it's the fertilizer subsidy to the procurement price problem and so on, I really feel this is where a healthy dose of kind of letting market forces work and let government focus on infrastructure and providing minimum income support to the very poor would be my broad vision. But again, this is a bit of a, you know, a pat answer to a potentially very uh, big and complicated topic. Thank you. Uh, we're going to stop the questioning at this junction, but don't worry, it doesn't stop stops here for today. You're most free to come in tomorrow at 9.30 where we are having a one-on-one -on -one session and all your unanswered questions can be addressed at that point in time. Uh, we realize because in the afternoon we have a visioning exercise with Professor Gandak for some vice school of economics where the faculty are going to be uh, with him. But tomorrow at 9.30 we have asked you to sign up for the uh, session at Ambedkar and it's going to be the first 100 people to pick up. Right. So please get going with that and I think th there are so many questions that I have to ask which I'm going to discuss in tomorrow's session. So we we'll keep this session at this moment. Food for thought for you, come in more harm and then see which one will come into Thank you, Thank sir. you. Thank, Thank you, you uh, We now request Dr. Dehbulal Dhakar, Deputy Director SSE, to give a vote of thanks. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's an absolute privilege to place this vote of thanks on behalf of the Simbasi School of Economics and uh, Simbasi International Dimmed University. Uh, let me first thank uh, our Chancellor, Professor Muzumdar, the Pro Chancellor, Dr. Riyad Dekar, the Vice Chancellor, Dr. Rajini, Dean Academics, Dr. Bhama, to um, help us organize this, to support us in all way to make this event a grand success. Let me also um, put on record our, uh, what should I say, our uh, uh, thankfulness from the core of the heart to Mrs. Tendulkar for allowing us and giving us the permission to conduct the Suresh Tendulkar Memorial Lecture at SSE. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for this. Uh, we are really obliged for this, uh, rendering this honor to us. Uh, let me also thank our director, Professor Jyoti Chandiramani, for her ever uh, fertile mind and keeping up with a lot of ideas, coming up with a lot of ideas to take SSE to the next level. And uh, this year, it was her brainchild that she thought to invite Professor Ghatak and Professor Ghatak had kindly agreed to come here. Uh, to say something about Professor Ghatak at this point, let me just go back to uh, uh, Dominic Lapierre. Many people might have heard of him, the author of City of Joy. So once Dominic had said somewhere that Kolkata is the city of Tego, Teresa and Joy. And later on, we Bengalis, what you have done, we believed and we started to say that it's not about only those three. Kolkata is a city of Tego, Teresa, Ray, Ghatak, and Joy. Professor Maitrish Ghatak belongs to the rare breed of uh, uh, 
carry the genealogy complete family who has devoted, devoted themselves to understanding the notions of poverty, be it Riti Khatak, be it Mahashrata Devi, and uh, be it Professor Maitresh Khatak. Thank you, sir. Thank you for coming to the Symbiosis School of Economics. And we are really honored to have you here. Uh, and uh, uh, thanks to our students, thanks to our colleagues, thanks to all of uh, the audience who are present here, who have made it. Uh, this day to be a grand success. Thanks to the technicians, the photographers, our all student volunteers, Chirag, Apurva, and the entire student community. Thank you all. Uh, as ma'am has uh, announced that tomorrow at 9.30 sharp, the first 100 students should be uh, allowed to sit at the Ambedkar Editorium, Ambedkar Conference Hall to have a one-to-one -one interaction with Professor Ghatak. So we'll see you again tomorrow. Come up with the questions, shoot the questions, and get the answers. See you all tomorrow. Bye. Thank you very much. Guys, before leaving, we request you to stand for the national anthem.